Um, so grand rounds, I think this is the first grand rounds of the new academic year. So welcome everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, this is my first grand round, so hopefully I don't mess this up. Uh, I'm hoping to take the Rob Stenstrom approach as well, so I'm hopefully not presenting at all today. I think that's the new gold standard for presentations at Grand Rounds. Um, so the way it's going to work is that Frank's going to give us a bit of an update on research, and then we have one of the new infectious disease docs here, Will, who's going to give us a talk. Uh, then Indy, our, one of our R3 residents, is going to chat, and then uh, hopefully Sean Bristol from Plastic Surgery is going to come down and chat with us as well. So the theme of today is going to be infectious disease, um, so hopefully you guys uh, enjoy this. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, hey, how you doing? So uh, this is my first grand rounds as the, uh, the interim research head here, and I've got some, some big shoes to fill. I'm not quite as good at CrossFit as Rob is, obviously, but... Uh, so what I th thought we'd do, one of the, the things, themes that really came out when we talked with everybody was just communication. So this is going to be something we do every year. We discussed this with uh, Ben Wilson, who's the rounds coordinator here. And every, every three months or so, uh, we're going to have a quick update of what we're doing in research just to keep you, know, uh, keep you uh, sort of appraised of what's going on. There's going to be some prospective studies coming, so you may as well know about it now, including some, uh, some stuff with uh, you know, elderly patients and patients with uh, substance misuse. So it's probably good to talk about it right now, at least to plant the idea in there. So this is what's happened over the past three months, um, just to show we haven't been sitting around all day. Um, so uh, a couple of us, uh, Jim Christensen and myself, are um, co-applicants, although Jim's a co-principal investigator on a $1.3 million grant to investigate high sensitivity troponins in men and women. This is by Karen Humphreys. And then David Barbic is a co-applicant on, on a grant of almost $900,000 to study basically the CT head rule in, in elderly patients. Those are the two big scholarships for the summer. Ongoing projects right now. The RAC trial, David's trials, enrolled 25 patients. There's, uh, we've been engaging with the nurses and ancillary staff about how things are going. There's no major complaints there. There's a study called Tech for Home. Who has heard of this? Put your hands right up. So a couple people heard of this study. Uh, we're going to have to probably promote this a little more. This is a study by Dr. Kendall Ho involving wearables for patients with heart failure. In pilot studies, this showed that it reduced the uh, recidivism rate to the emergency department substantially just by giving these people, uh, you know, ability to monitor their vital signs post-discharge. But that's probably something we'll have to work on a little bit harder to get more people involved. Uh, Garth is ongoing work in his project for patient safety and resilience. And of course, uh, our ongoing ECMO study is, uh, well, still ongoing. I don't know how many things we've had in the past while, and Brian's in Moab right now, so you can't really comment on that. Starting soon, Andy, do you want to know I'm putting you on the spot here, but we'll probably be doing uh, something like um, we did with Take a and we're probably going to be starting handing out Suboxone like candy here reasonably soon. So just be prepared. This is what's going to be coming up. This has been a huge amount of work. For, for, for Andrew, uh, liaising with, with nursing, with pharmacy, with community, with addictions, with mental health, to try and get this straightened out that we can hand out Subox a lot more efficiently. Right now, our Subox starts aren't working at all, or very, very minimally. And this is an opportunity to really help out our vulnerable patients. Uh, this is the test kitchen probably for British Columbia and maybe for most of Western Canada. So we're going to be devoting a lot of time and energy to making sure this gets done correctly. Andy also spearheading a project to uh, survey emergency physicians about suboxone use and attitudes, and this is uh, all going to be all over Canada as well. So Andrew's working on that, and that's something that you'll be seeing in the next little while. Research groups, well, some of you know we have uh, the Formal Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium from Canada and the U.S. isn't really working that well anymore. Funding stopped a while ago. We have CanRock, the Canadian Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. So Brian and Jim thought it would be a great idea to have BCROC, BC Resuscitations Outcome Consortium. Most of the studies that Brian has presented or has published uh, are with this database. We're liaising with cardiologists, critical care specialists, paramedics, and nurses to try and optimize uh, cardiac arrest care in British Columbia. Uh, Andrew and myself are also involved in the Vancouver Emergency Opioid Working Group. Uh, this is a group of emergency physicians at Lionsgate and St. Paul's who are trying to standardize and streamline best care and implement best evidence for patients with substance misuse, especially op opioid, op uh, opioid misuse, and try and export these things uh, regionally and then provincially. So this is a group of us that basically both groups meet once a month and have a bunch of research projects and a bunch of implementation projects to try and uh, try and optimize care for these patient groups. Um, 
a couple of recent manuscripts out there. Uh, Jim, I know I'm putting you on the spot, and I messaged this, actually messaged this out to everybody last night in a PDF form. But Jim, do you, uh, you want to share the results of this one? I'm putting you on the spot. You're the senior author on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we've, we've talked about this before, that uh, BC does have uh, the best recorded outcomes in cardiac arrest, out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest outcomes in, in the country. It's recorded and up among the best in the world. So Brian actually did all the, the legwork on this. And so over a period of um, 10 years, we looked at, you know, how much did that improve? And it sort of more than doubled up to close to 15%. Depends a little bit on how you sort of calculate that. Uh, I think the final for this study was more like 14, around 14%. 16. It was 16. 16. Yeah. See, the number changes every time. So I can't remember on each, each individual analysis we do. But it's around that, which is excellent. And we tried to look at that related to some of the interventions and changes that have happened, particularly in pre-hospital care, but not only pre-hospital care. And sort of a lot of iterative kind of events that have happened. And we think that all of those kind of put together has been what's driven our success. Yeah. So that paper was accepted a little while. This is only this is only stuff that's been accepted very recently. The summer is also a fallow period for publishing for publishing research. The other paper, and I, you, some of you have seen this image before, is a case that uh, David uh, David was the principal physician on, and I happened to walk in on this case. And uh, some of you have seen this before, but uh, that reverse B with an arrow pointing is pointing to it as an aortic valve. Uh, that's not where an aortic valve should be. Anyway, uh, Dave wrote the case up and uh, published it in Annals. Uh, a couple days ago, so congratulations for that. So that's what the research group's been up to, and uh, if you have any comments or questions, I'm still really new at this, let me know what we're doing good, what we're doing bad, and what we could use some help on. All righty, thank you very much. Switch it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's my dongle, so. Come right Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah. There we go. All right. Great. Well, thank you, Simon, for the invitation, especially for the first grand rounds of the year. Um, I'm William Connors. I'm one of the new infectious disease physicians here coming by way of Calgary and Atlanta. I split my time between St. Paul's and the BCCDC's TB program. So. I really look forward to the opportunity to get to know more of you. I don't know much of the emergency department well, but obviously you're big consumers of our uh, consulting services. So um, when Simon asked me about talking today, I thought I'd actually do a new talk. So I haven't done this one before. And the reason for this is that I think it complements the case that's going to be talked about later with necrotizing fasciitis and a bit around the idea that antimicrobials are just a small piece of management of severe infections. And I wanted to talk about steroids particularly. Um, this is something that for me, uh, some recent publications, uh, both in septic shock, but also community acquired pneumonia, have begun to change my practice patterns. And I'd like to see if it's maybe influencing yours. So a couple of disclosures. Um, I disproportionately see infections. That's what I do, just like you guys see emergencies. And so when I think about steroids in infection, I'm seeing the complications. I'm seeing the individuals that have super infections or subsequent reactivation of opportunistic infections. I also seldom prescribe steroids. I'm more frequently asked to come and bless individuals prescribing high-dose steroids for systemic vasculitis or other inflammatory conditions. Before I get into my talk, I would like to know a bit more what your practice patterns are. So do you at present uh, use corticosteroids for acute infections, specifically excluding syndromes where there are already established practices around steroid use? We're not going to discuss the evidence specifically for those, but what about for sepsis, uh, community-acquired pneumonia, uh, other conditions, just by a show of hands? Yeah. What, what conditions are you using it for? Okay, 
Excellent. Good. Can I see another hand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I want to. I'll repoll at the end, and I'll be curious to see if I sway anybody by uh, a quite a quick, rapid summary here. So here's the objectives of my talk today. Um, this is going to be a very rapid overview. In 30 minutes, I'm covering a massive amount of literature, and I'm going to pick out some particularly high-level information so that we can uh, discuss that. And I hope that this will raise questions and stimulate discussions more than give definitive answers. Specifically today, I'm going to be talking about a focus on community-acquired pneumonia and septic shock. Uh, with an emphasis on safety, because this was a big thing for me, seeing complications of steroids. Uh, this is something that's changed my pattern of practice. So to start, for simplicity reasons throughout this talk, I'll be using the term steroids. I'm referring to specifically uh, glucocorticoids, but uh, corticosteroids as a group, um, and I'm not referring to anabolic steroids. When I talk about steroids and understanding the literature, it's particularly important to understand the differentiation between what is referred to as low-dose steroid therapy and high-dose steroid therapy. Low-dose typically being about five to 10 times basal uh, steroids. So rough equivalents would be about 200 milligrams of hydrocort per day or 40 to 50 milligrams of prednisone. High-dose steroids, on the other hand, would be looking up at, this is the pulse steroids that we're seeing in acute vasculitides, be around one gram of methylprednisolone. In critical illness, there's much discussion about the relative insufficiency of steroids and relative adrenal insufficiency. These are somewhat nebulous terms that aren't well-defined with no consensus definitions, but those definitions will come up and I'll talk about them in some studies. Our understanding of steroid pharmacodynamics continues to evolve. Um, simplified, though, in terms of the immunomodulatory effects uh, these occur through both induction and inhibition mechanisms, uh, influencing both genetic expression, but also direct tissue and cytokine effects. And so through this milieu of effect, you get uh, immunomodulation to downregulate some immune response, particularly in an overblown immune response to acute infections. We're all well-versed in the chronic uh, effects of steroids, when seen in patients with either chronic exogenous or endogenous uh, steroids. Um, shortly after the original studies back in the 1930s and 40s, it became apparent that although highly effective for conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, there was a long list of uh, side effects. I think it probably shows up a bit small here, but I want to highlight that these are the chronic side effects of steroids. Um, these steroid effects don't typically occur in the short course or acute setting. Uh, in fact, acute effects are more around the protective rather than the detrimental. You see the balance that I've presented here looking at severe acute infections. So on the side of infection control, these are potentially detrimental effects of steroids through immunomodulation. But the collateral damage is what a lot of research is focused on. Infections are pro-inflammatory conditions, and these states are severe forms of inflammation that lead to thrombosis, uh, end organ hypoperfusion, and some of the other collateral damages are listed here, iris being the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome that we see. This is classically described when reconstituting an individual with HIV, but steroids can also have this effect. Um, in addition, the Yarex herxheimer which is prototypically described with secondary syphilis, uh, treating the disseminated disease early on after penicillin. These people are paradoxically worsen despite effective therapy. And that's largely around the immune response. Moving now on to community-acquired pneumonia, or specifically, a lot of research has gone into acute respiratory tract infections. Uh, this is given their frequency and morbidity. Um, we already regularly use steroids for a number of pulmonary syndromes that have infection overlap. Those are going to be COPD, asthma, uh, croup, pharyngitis, uh, ARDS. However, specifically looking at infections, there's been a series of fairly consistent studies that have come out on viral acute respiratory tract infections, and these have shown no benefit and even some harm. Studies that came out with SARS and H1N1 showed that there were adverse outcomes, both in terms of infection complications but disease progression. Looking specifically at community-acquired pneumonia, 
uh, which is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality and something I, see, I assume you see very frequently in the emergency department. There's been particular interest as if can we do better in severe forms with a mortality of 20 to 40 percent in the most severe forms. This condition, despite optimal therapy, still has suboptimal outcomes. So a lot of more recent inf uh, research has been on corticosteroids specifically in CAP. And I'm intrigued to hear that there's actually some already some practice using steroids in this condition. So by 2017, there had been a large number of RCTs that had come out in a series of meta-analyses uh, that had really conflicting results, particularly around the clinical benefit. Um, last year, a uh, publication in the Cochrane Review series uh, looked at an update on a previous series. And importantly, this included two of the largest trials to date in community-acquired pneumonia uh, that were published both in 2015. I put a brief summary of what the review contained here. But the major findings from this review were specifically looking at community or healthcare associated bacterial pneumonia, and they found no increase in superinfections. They did a no increase in adverse effects beyond hyperglycemia. That was news to me. I often thought of this as potentially worsening disease. In addition, there was consistent findings in this meta analysis or this review and previous studies, specifically looking at reduction in morbidity. When they look at reduced morbidity, the endpoints that they're using here are lower clinical failure rates. And those clinical failure rates were characterized as either chest x-ray progression, early clinical stability, shorter hospital and ICU stays, and reduced ventilator times, all of which I think are fairly meaningful from a healthcare utilization perspective. Um, the novel finding here was that there was a signal towards, uh, and actually significant in their analysis, mortality benefit in the subset of individuals with severe community-acquired pneumonia. To appreciate the types of uh, community-acquired pneumonia patients that they were seeing this benefit in, severe community-acquired pneumonia, these are individuals with pneumonia and asepsis syndrome. Severe CAP was defined across these studies uh, using the PSI, or Pneumonia Severity Index, and specifically looking at the group of class 4-5 disease based on this um, collection of criteria, we know that in this subset, mortality, even uh, with most aggressive interventions, ranges from 20 to 40 percent, particularly when admitted to the ICU. Looking specifically at this mortality data, and this was a subset of nine studies uh, that were deemed high enough quality for review after reviewing the available literature that looked at adults and looked at individuals that had mortality outcomes for individuals with severe pneumonia that was objective. Um, this, this study here, it's a bit hard to see the data, but the spread here is really looking at the relative risk, uh, the risk ratios and the weights attributed to each study. You'll notice that at the top of this is the uh, lower risk studies, and it includes those two 2015 trials. When you look at those ones, you'll see that the confidence intervals do cross one, um, however, uh, when pooled, including all the studies, both those with uh, slightly higher risk of bias, there is this uh, uh, significant finding with a risk ratio that is uh, on the uh, negative side of, the, of one. Specifically, their conclusion here is what to prevent a death, the number needed to treat was 18. So that's a very rapid introduction to steroids and CAP. I took from that uh, that the consensus now is showing no significant harm beyond hyperglycemia and potential benefit, meaningful early clinical benefits, and a signal in the severest form towards uh, mortality benefit. I'll build on that, and we'll talk now about uh, sepsis. So this is an ongoing saga of research with conflicting evidence on both sides. However, there has been uh, an update on some of this uh, data based on two major clinical trials that came out uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, that's the adrenal and approach study. And I'm going to talk about how those fit into the existing literature. And I think that it starts to solidify a theme about steroids in these severe infections, like severe pneumonia, that is compelling. So early on, there was some positive, very promising observational studies of steroids in uh, sepsis. However, these were using high-dose steroids, typically that methylprednisolone high-dose. And with RCTs that came out in the early 90s, it became apparent that there was a significant increased risk uh, 
uh, secondary to infections and uh, mortality uh, was worse in the subset that got high dose steroids. This led to the newer wave or the second wave of studies that has looked at specifically subgroups and low dose steroids. So these sepsis subgroup trials are what I'm going to talk about quickly. The first major study was in 2002 uh, when it was published. This was a French multicenter RCT by Anan, uh, Anani et al. Um, and this study, you can see some of the characteristics here, was specifically looking at the subgroup of individuals that were deemed septic shock. So these are individuals that required vasopressor therapy. And in addition, they were categorized as relative adrenal insufficiency. So the definition of relative adrenal insufficiency in this study and a series of subsequent studies was the use of a high-dose high ACT stim test that saw inadequate response, um, so typically less than 10 after high-dose uh, uh, ACTH stim. The conclusions from this study, just looking at the mortality endpoint, and again, I should say this was low-dose trial. This was using hydrocortisone 50 for seven days, 50Q6, um, versus placebo. And in this study, they showed that there was a significant mortality outcut, outcome at 28 days in the group that received steroids. Also, they did not see an increase in adverse events, similar to those low-dose studies in community-acquired pneumonia. This was when they looked at the ACTH responders, so people that weren't adrenal insufficient, uh, relatively adrenal insufficient, there was no significant difference between groups. However, uh, subsequently, a larger multinational study, now going beyond France to several European, Australia, and New Zealand uh, centers, there was conflicting data. This was the Corticus trial. The Corticus trial, again, looked at septic shock, relative adrenal insufficiency, and this time they were using hydrocort 50 Q6 times five days with a taper. So roughly the same usage of hydrocort at a low dose uh, quantity. They did not show a mortality benefit. And this put uh, initially some uh, cooling on the initial uh, optimism about steroids finally solidifying a role in a subgroup of people. Based largely on those and a series of other studies, the surviving sepsis guidelines in 2016 came out with this really tepid uh, recommendation, um, weak quality of evidence uh, or weak recommendations. And I equate this to much like a Dr. Nick recommendation. It's not, it's not something that I was comfortable using up front. However, that was before the two major recent clinical trials and by far the largest looking at this question. So these subsequent landmark trials were published this year. Uh, the first of them that I'll talk about is the adrenal trial. So this was adjunctive corticosteroid treatment in critically ill patients with septic shock, uh, a multinational RCT again, and this was by far the largest study in this topic. We're looking at over 3,000 individuals, and again, these are septic shock, so, um, and individuals on mechanical ventilation. And the intervention here was low-dose steroids, uh, hydrocort versus placebo. They had a primary outcome of mortality at 90 days. The study ran from 2013 through 2017, so a four-year study. And that's important because that's also looking at kind of what the 2016 sepsis guidelines and the rest of our sepsis management guidelines were incorporating in terms of critical illness management. Here's the um, Kaplan-Meier plot from their study. They did not identify a 90-day mortality benefit. Um, Non-significant difference, as you can see here with the lines near parallel. Um, however, they did find that in this, in, in this population, uh, vasopressor days and ventilator days were reduced. And interestingly, a novel finding for them was that blood transfusions were less frequent amongst the steroid-receiving groups. And again, importantly, no difference in infectious adverse events in this trial. Hyperglycemia, again, noted. Then comes the second trial. So this was the approaches trial, and this has been uh, a highly productive research project that has had a number of publications. It was the one that had the activated protein C studies that was pulled in 2011, but this was the data from them running from 2008 through 2015. And this was a multi-center RCT in France. Um, population was uh, over 1,000 patients, again, with septic shock. And the intervention here was hydrocort. They also used fludrocort, um, so a mineral corticoid as well. Um, and they were looking at low-dose hydrocortisone. Uh, 
Initially, it was plus or minus or combinant human activated protein C, but that was pulled in 2011 and compared against placebo. And again, for comparison reasons, they used the 90-day mortality primary endpoint. And they concluded that this saves lives. They showed a significant mortality benefit, and they showed no difference in serious, side effect, uh, serious adverse events. When we look in more detail at what this study showed, they showed not only uh, the 90-day mortality, but they showed short and long-term mortality, except at the 28-day point. And this was demonstrated, as you can see in the table here. You can see the numbers needed to treat down the side there as well. And these are in the range of what I was talking about with severe community-acquired pneumonia. So there's lots of critiques out there on these two studies. And some of them, the best ones I find, come from the emergency medicine groups that have been critically evaluating a couple of these head-to-head uh, -head these studies. But the major ones that come out across most of the critiques that I've read through are around disease severity differences. Why did we see non-significant and then significant differences? Well, perhaps it was in the most severely ill individuals. If you look at, remember that in the uh, approaches trial, this trial had uh, over 40% mortality in both groups. Whereas in the adrenal trial, it was less than 30% in both groups. So perhaps it's more related to the severe disease. Also, there was uh, some trial design differences. Um, the individuals in the approaches trial was over a much longer period, which may reflect some differences in ICU practices. Um, as well, it was not primarily designed specifically to compare um, low-dose steroids, but it also contained active variant protein C. When that was pulled, there's been critiques that that may have influenced some of their uh, required sample size calculations. In addition, the differences in patients need to be considered. Um, the adrenal trial had more individuals with abdominal infections specifically, and abdominal infections were often ones that had surgical intervention. Does that subgroup have a different uh, outcomes with regards to steroids? It's unclear. And different critical illness scoring systems were used. So between the approaches and adrenals trials, direct comparison is difficult because it's Apache 2 versus uh, SOFA and SAPSI scores. And that has made it uh, somewhat difficult to say that these are directly comparable groups. Alternatively, perhaps this is just a French phenomenon. Um, this is something that was shown in that original study by Anani et al. in 2002, and more recently in this single uh, national study. So when I look at this data, and I've been following along and had disinterest, but regained interest when I saw these new studies, was does this influence where the next sepsis guidelines are going to be? I do think that consistent across these low-dose studies, particularly in uh, uh, septic shock, that there's a consistent safety profile. These studies have all shown that there is not an increase in superinfection as was identified with high-dose steroid, steroid therapy in the past. In addition, there is some disease benefits. There are these meaningful benefits in terms of reduced vasopressor days, uh, shorter, hospital, uh, shorter ICU and hospital stays. And from the newer two studies, I'm starting to see that there is some compelling evidence that there may be mortality benefit, particularly in that uh, severely ill group of septic shock. So that's a whirlwind summary of the highest level data out of those studies. And I wanted to stimulate some conversation around this. I want to conclude by my conclusions here and see if you concur. But my conclusions are that low-dose steroids, specifically in CAP, as well as sepsis, are safe. They do reduce inflammatory sequelae. And this is important. For community-acquired pneumonia, this is clinical stability endpoints, ventilator, ICU, hospital stay uh, durations, and chest X-ray stability. For sepsis, it reduces vasopressor use and ventilator days. And there is that, uh, that finding in the adrenal study about reducing uh, transfusions that needs to be looked at further. <clears throat> Finally, and the most controversial one is around, this may actually reduce mortality. I think that this has been consistently shown, and the Cochrane Review helped me conclude that severe cap probably is one that definitely there's a role for steroids in, low-dose steroids. The septic shock patients, I think the verdict's still out. But in terms of satisfying the first do-no-harm principle, I think that there is a role for using low-dose steroids in this setting, and I'm curious to hear what your guys' practice patterns are. So maybe to poll at the end here, based on this data, will this change anybody's practice? 
Would anybody start using low-dose steroids for either of these conditions? Maybe one or two more hands, yeah. What I've done here is I've cherry-picked a little bit of data. I haven't fully reviewed all of the detailed uh, details around patient populations, and I'd be open to discuss that a bit more, but I wanted for the purpose of a short talk like this, touch on some of the more controversial elements, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. What's the threshold in terms of ports for, because it looks like steroids are the only thing for people with moderate and severe pain. So is there a specific port score cutoff where you would consider initiating and then not initiating? I think that's a good question. I think the the certainly for the mortality endpoint, uh, we're looking at people with uh, PSI scores that are they're high, class four or five. But for the uh, morbidity endpoints um, from that Cochrane review, that's much more heterogeneous in terms of uh, the benefit as getting those clinical outcomes. Um, I don't think it's clarified. I think what they've shown from that is that there was no adverse, uh, there was no adverse signal or, uh, or endpoints that were more significant in the steroid group. And so the question is, do we roll this out for all CAP, everybody that comes in? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, at this point, I think the more ill they are with a convincing uh, community-acquired pneumonia picture, the more likely I think steroids are uh, going to play a beneficial role. But uh, how mild the case is unclear to me. My second question is first statement patient who is already on steroids for whatever, whatever reason. Um, and let's say they're in the prep so they're coming in with the infections and illness and they have a coronavirus process to a positive problem. What kind of augmentation and what dose of steroid should be dose of augmentation? It's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think in those individuals with adrenal insufficiency at baseline or already uh, potentially having their endogenous adrenal secretion reduced, um, going a minimum low dose, do we go higher than that? I don't know of evidence that supports that. So certainly going up to the low dose steroids at a minimum and potentially uh, adjuvanting that with uh, double that. A lot of steroid dosing is, uh, is poorly, uh, uh, poorly researched. Okay. Yeah. Has anybody ever looked in, in these studies specifically, they were looking at uh, hydrocort. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I know that we use a lot more dexamethasone uh, when I'm wearing my tuberculosis medicine hat, and that's more for TB meningitis, and certainly from the bacterial meningitis studies, that was dexamethasone. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Kind of a pedantic question, but the dose of methylprednisolone that people choose, so... The equivalent dose of 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone is about, you know, 50 milligrams of methylprednisolone. Of prednisone? Methyl. What's the dose of methylprednisolone? Because people, sometimes we say 40 milligrams because it's like five to one between hydrocortisone and, uh, and, and uh, methylprednisolone. But people want to give 125 milligrams of methylprednisolone. Not sure why. And... So can you just comment on what you would consider to be the, the, the dose? If we're going to use this and we're using IV we, and we, someone wants to give methylprednisolone, what should they, what's the dose? You don't know. So what exactly would be off-time patients that are in the acidification? Um, it will give IV. Just because 125, that's why using methylpred over hydrocort? It's just IV. That's just what we have access to, I think, in our emergency room. Yeah. Uh, we have both. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't guess know the point that, I'm making is people tend to give two or three times the dose. Sure. Right? People yeah. are tending to give two or three times the dose just because that's what comes in the bag or whatever. But as we're setting up um, regional ED guidelines around the management of this, we would we would prefer to offer up one mm -hmm one dose if there's no so anyway it's not a huge issue i it's just confusing to me because some the equivalent dose is 50 milligrams of methylprednisolone or 40 milligrams and and people give 125 and there's 
I, I would worry from, from the earlier studies, as you went into the higher dose categories, you started to see more of the adverse, adverse events. I would say that I would err on keeping as close to equivalent with the low dose studied uh, equivalent. So that would be the lower dose. Yeah. I'd have to look again at the at the Cochrane review with the, the subgroups, um, specifically those that had another inflammatory or like obstructive lung disease condition, but um, I'm not sure. It's an important point. I mean, these people that are seeing the benefit for non-infections, but again, that's what we're getting at here is that this is that inflammatory sequelae um, and that cap in and out, a, a separate from uh, existing obstructive lung disease potentially is one of those conditions that we're already fairly comfortable using for asthma and uh, COPD. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I think it's interesting. There's more and more data on adjunctive therapies, whether it be steroids, vitamin C, thionin, being added on for sepsis. And sometimes it can be somewhat hard in, in, from an emergency department to see what's being implemented on the wards. Are you advocating, just to clarify, steroids, low dose, recognizing that higher dose steroids are, have been linked to this mortality and morbidity uh, for all community acquired pneumonia, the ones that we admit, the ones that we intubate, the ones that are truly septic, where do you feel the cutoff is, and are you, are you recommending a lot of adjunctive therapies on the wards that we just don't see because there's no one necessarily a feedback mechanism? We don't necessarily see what happens once they go to the ICU or, or the inpatient wards. So, so I'm, I'm actually seeing on my ID consult side of things very little of this. It's done by, uh, it's done by intensive care, uh, or I wonder if it's done by your group, and that's partly what I'm asking today. Um, what am I recommending? If people call me about a mild cap that's not coming into hospital, that almost never happens. Um, you guys manage that algorithmically. So I'm not sure what's happening there. I think now there's going to be more people using it for uh, run-of-the-mill cap, uh, severity independent. I do believe, especially if I'm in, or engaged early on, I'm going to be thinking more about using low-dose steroids. I think that the evidence is in support of that. Yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, we see tons of patients that are coming in with sepsis and septic shock. And, I mean, even for septic shock, there does seem to be a wide spectrum. There are patients that come in with lactates of six that only require maybe like five of levofed to augment their blood pressure. And I've been in the common practice of uh, empirically giving patients hydrocortisone if they come in with severe refractory septic shock. So they're coming in with uh, requiring levofed levels greater than 50 mics per minute to augment their blood pressure. And in those patients, I would think, you know, they probably do have some element of adrenal insufficiency and I'd empirically give it to them. But I, I feel like if we're empirically giving um, hydrocortisone to patients who are coming in only requiring like 10 mics per minute of levofed, our colleagues from the ICU would scoff at us. Uh, so do you think that there is some like there should be some kind of consen uh, consensus between, I guess, like eMERGE and ICU and infectious disease uh, in that regard? Yeah, I think there needs to be a collaborative approach. You'll be managing upfront and transitioning, and then ID consultant will get in, uh, if at all, fairly late. Um, you, you point out a couple of important things, and that, uh, to be clear, this, this relative adrenal insufficiency has been controversial. Um, how objectively to document it in critical illness is not clear. And the newer, the two largest trials that came out were not subset uh, now analyzing that. They weren't looking at people with ACTH stim test results. Um, so what they are looking at, though, and I don't know if I highlighted this enough, is that these are individuals that are showing uh, catecholamine dependence, that they are getting supplemental uh, vasopressors, and despite that, are not showing uh, early clinical improvement. So this is your, uh, going to be your septic shock patient that is on vasopressors and not showing a turnaround. The time point of that is unclear. In the approaches trial, they were looking at comparing with the adrenal trial whether earlier initiation. And I think as we get away from uh, depending on fluid or volume in these patients, 
and focusing on potentially earlier introduction of vasopressors. The bigger question is, what's the sweet spot to add in the steroids? I'm not sure that's clear yet. I do think in that individual that you get from the whole clinical picture, the gestalt that this is someone who is a particularly severe form of septic shock is not showing that early improvement after fluid and on vasopressors, that that is the group that has stood out potentially with the most benefit. And I think that that should be part of the pathway, as a sepsis pathway should include this. And I wonder what the new sepsis guidelines will have. I don't know when the update's coming out. I suspect they'll upgrade the recommendation from weak to moderate record, uh, evidence. Um, thanks for your talk. So I guess I have to follow up on that. I have um, two questions. One is about the timing of the steroids. So, I mean, we know in PJP and TB meningitis that, yes, you want to get those steroids on board early before even giving the antimicrobial. You know, is there any kind of signal about the timing of the steroids in these patients? I mean, I think it's still, because this is kind of, I would say there's a signal, but I, I wouldn't say I'm complete, as someone who's followed this for a long time, I'm mm -hmm. not overwhelmingly convinced right now. And so I'm sort, of, I'm sort of feeling like, well, unless there's some kind of suggestion that it's really on us to start it right at the same time as antibiotics, I'm sort of feeling like, well, I might sit back and see what comes up in the next couple of years of the new sepsis, surviving sepsis guidelines, and then decide what to do. So I guess one question is just about the, the time criticality of this, of giving steroids in these either <laughs> cap, severe cap or severe sepsis. And the other one is the, the one study that seemed to have the highest signal, uh, the approach one, was also was using fluorocortisone. So, you know, should we be... And, you know, what's the timing of that? Should we be giving fludrocortisone, you know, a mineral corticoid in those, in those patients? This is a great point. It's one that uh, maybe I'll go in reverse order. But one thing I didn't highlight here was both the 2002 trial out of France and then the approaches trial were combination with flu fludrocortisone. Um, however, the other research around fludrocortisone hasn't uh, made it clearly uh, a go-to agent. There is no clear recommendation on fludrocortisone. And that has not been used in the other trials. As such, I think fludrocortisone's role is to be determined. Um, in terms of timing, that's a great question. Uh, I, think, I think that I would view them slightly differently between uh, CAP and, uh, and sepsis, specifically based on uh, the pathophysiology, knowing that in uh, pneumocystis, as an example, the rationale for the early initiation in severe disease is that we know that with that early treatment, we're getting a significant inflammatory response. This is something we also see in our patients like the yards herxheimer reaction with secondary syphilis. Now, if that's occurring in the lungs, morbidity is quite high. I wonder if earlier initiation in those severe forms for severe pneumonia may actually have a timing-specific importance. In the septic shock patients, I'm not, I'm not as clear if the pathophysiology is the same. I think those individuals have a, a robust and overwhelming inflammatory response. Uh, when we introduce it, uh, I think is, uh, is unclear. But I wouldn't view it pathophysiologically the same as the pneumonia patient. But certainly timing will be important. And what is our cutoff? How early do we say that they have, they have declared themselves severe or, or septic shock despite initial interventions without steroids? I'm not sure that's settled. There was, there was brief comment, and I didn't include for sakes of time, but this is not ready for prime time. I don't know if you guys have followed the vitamin C trial. So this is vitamin C, uh, high-dose vitamin C, thymine, uh, thymine around the idea of uh, precipitant in the kidney or, or crystals in the kidney, uh, theoretically, and low-dose steroids. So steroids are part of this, but the data out of this is uh, uh, curious, you know, incredible outcomes. This is not an RCT. Um, there is now an RCT, um, so the Victus trial is something that's being uh, rolled out right now in rolling, and they're looking specifically at, is there a role for vitamin C? I don't think this is ready for prime time, though. Yeah. Is anybody here using vitamin C up front in their severe sepsis or septic shock? No? Okay. Yeah. I was curious because I had a lot of questions about this when I presented at a GP conference in, in Victoria, and it caught me off guard. Um, I had not heard about this, but this is a single center in Virginia, and it's, uh, I think, controversial initial findings. But this is, a, this is a severe mortality condition, and I think we do need to explore this. And I'm, I'm impressed how quickly uh, uh, a multi-center RCT has been set up. 
to hopefully either debunk or support this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just uh, very quickly um, to explain a couple of things. Summer over the residency began, obviously the, the EM residency began um, July 1. We really wanted to introduce all our residents today in person and with some nice bios and things. Unfortunately, Rob took a shift. And the other thing, unfortunately, and also good for the residents, is that there's a, a full-on palliative care day at uh, Lionsgate Hospital. So hopefully the residents are watching this uh, t uh, talk now, but we're going to delay introducing them formally, or to those of you that have not met them in a, in a fun and, and, and nice way in our next rounds in, in October. But Indy Sahota, who's done a lot of um, research in the past and is one of the EM residents, has graciously volunteered to give us his grand rounds now, and he's missing this very important palliative care talk too, so he's going to whip through his rounds and then head on over, and uh, he will have his formal introduction next month, too. But we're really excited about these people and um, looking forward to uh, spending the time with them. So just wanted to say something just so that you know why the residents are not here and why Indy's doing this and then taking off. Thanks, Wilson. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, Simon. Um, so I've been asked today to talk about toxic shock syndrome, or TSS. I'm kind of cognizant of the time, so, I mean, imagine a bit rushed. Um, but we'll kind of get through this as quickly as we can. My name's Indy. I'm one of the new R3s here in the CCFP EM program. So we'll kind of jump right into it. Uh, we'll start off with this case. So a 14-year-old, otherwise healthy female, immunizations are up to date. She had been feeling unwell for a couple of days with some kind of flu-like illness. Uh, one morning, she's found delirious by her mum, and she was brought to the emergency department. There, she was found to be hypotensive, tacky, febrile, and with this kind of erythematous but nonspecific rash. Um, she got some labs up front. Um, everything was high, one thing was low, all of it was bad. Um, she had a chest x-ray at that point, which was normal, and there were just some blood and some protein in the urinalysis. Initially, the hypotension didn't respond to fluids, so she was started on an epinephrine infusion, and the GCS remained depressed, uh, so she was intubated for kind of expectations of care. She started on broad-spectrum antibiotics, and then when she was stable enough, was transferred over to BC Children's PICU. There, the blood culture eventually grew a group A strep, um, and she stayed in the PICU for 10 days after, before being discharged. And it turns out that her boyfriend had recently been diagnosed um, with a strep throat and had been treated for a month, couple of days before she came in. So the spoiler alert here is what is toxic shock syndrome? So it's an exotoxin-mediated condition, usually from strep, uh, staph or strep species, um, and it can lead to widespread inflammation, uh, inflammation um, hypotension, multi-organ failure, and if not treated promptly, uh, death. It's a medical emergency. And it's a challenge for eMERGE docs because it's one of those conditions that can be fatal. It sort of needs to be treated up front quickly, but it's ultimately quite rare, uh, as this nice 1980s poster describes to us. Having said that, in BC, the incidence rates have almost tripled. So in 2013, we had about 3.2 cases per 100,000. That's up to about 8.4 as of last year, and it looks like it's on track to be even higher this year. The reasons for this are not really well known. To be completely unhelpful, it's common in the young, it's more common in the old, and in the case of menstrual-associated TSS, uh, it's common in some women in between. Risk factors for this um, will be superabsorbent and prolonged tampon use, nasal packing, 
post-op wound infections, uh, recent flu, and immunocompromised states. Um, everybody loves pathophysiology, so I'm going to spend very little time on here. But a little refresher on what this syndrome is all about. So, first of all, there's multiple species of bugs that can cause toxic shock. Uh, the main two ones are Staph aureus, which is more common, and Strep, typically group A Strep, which is less common but typically is uh, characterized by more severe disease. Now, the basic mechanism here involves toxin production, um, that act, uh, which act as super antigens. This is not going to be ID level. Well, you're not going to be impressed by this, but it's simple enough, I think. These super antigens can bind to the major histocompatibility complex 2 on any antigen-presenting cell, like a macrophage, and it bypasses the usual antigen binding mechanism straight to the T cells. And what that does is you can get wide cell T cell, um, widespread T cell activation. And I saw a report of up to 20% of the body's T cells being activated at one time. And this causes a cytokine storm, which leads to increased vascular permeability and hemodynamic shock. Toxigenic strains of Staph aureus will produce two, ex two exotoxins, TSST1, or toxic uh, shock syndrome toxin 1, a mouthful, uh, and staphylococ staphylococcal enterotoxin. Almost all menstrual toxic shock cases uh, are due to TST, TSST1. And in contrast, that's only implicated in about half of non-menstrual cases of Staph TSS. For strep, uh, it's usually a complication of invasive infections involving group A strep or girl strep, strep pyogenes, but can also involve group B, C, and G, but this is usually much more rare. Typically, these are a result of skin and soft tissue infections. And here it's exotoxins A and B, which are the primary culprits. TSS remains a clinical diagnosis, but there are some clinical features uh, that differentiate staph and strep. Um, we've talked about the toxin differences already, so I'll kind of skip over that. Risk factors. So the staph toxic shock syndrome is the one that's implicated with tampon use. So obviously retained foreign bodies is going to be a risk factor here. Um, by comparison, necrotizing soft skin and soft tissue infections are more likely a risk factor for strep. Pain uh, might be more common at the site for strep TSS. This rash, this kind of macular diffuse erythroderma, that's just discussed, and I'll talk about it in the next slide a little bit more, is more common with staph TSS. Blood culture positivity, you're often not going to see a positive blood culture for staph TSS. About 5% is what I see in the report. If you swab any wounds, any mucosal sites with the retained foreign bodies, these are likely going to be positive, so it's worthwhile doing. Mortality varies considerably between the two, but like I said before, strep is kind of the more dangerous one of the two. So things to look out for. Um, the early symptoms are going to usually be fairly nonspecific. They might have some myalgias, malaise, they might have some chills, nausea, vomiting, and a fever, which is usually pretty rapid, on, rapid onset and often quite high. Eventually, um, this will progress to a tach tachycardia and tachypnea, and if persistent, hypotension, shock, and an organ failure. You might also clue into the etiology by examining the rash. So, like I mentioned before, they might have this diffuse macular erythroderma, kind of looks like this. It's blanching, usually affects the trunk first, then the extremities, and will involve the palms and soles. So that might be a clue. A week or two later, which won't be helpful in the eMERGE, this will desquamate. So that's kind of a characteristic feature, especially of staph TSS. Multi-organ involvement is another defining feature of TSS, and although the lab results uh, are going to kind of point you uh, in the direction of the affected organ system, this is ultimately a clinical diagnosis. Many of us will associate uh, TSS with tampon use because during the early 1980s, there was a surge of TSS, which was linked to tampon use in young menstruating women, with incidence rates kind of as high as 14 per 100,000, so we're almost double what we're seeing here in BC now. The rate has since decreased, uh, and is felt to be due to educational proper frequency and duration of tampon use and the removal of highly absorbent tampons from the market. But it still remains an important risk factor for staphylococcal TSS to be aware of. Women who developed TSS at that time typically were using tampons at a higher absorbency, like I mentioned, using them for continuously longer, maybe prophylactically before the period for longer, and they kept a single tampon in for a longer period of time as well. It's obviously important to note 
that it's not just women who use tampons that can get staph TSS, they're obviously prone to getting staph TSS like anybody else, anywhere else on other wounds. And approximately 15% of cases of staph TSS actually occur postpartum or as a complication of post-op wound infections. I'm not going to belabor this too much. Essentially, I just want to get to the point that there's a case definition, a formal case definition for toxic shock syndrome. CDC has one. BCCDC has a very similar one. Um, from the red sort of arrows here, these are symptoms I've already talked about. Um, it's reasonable kind of to order labs early on in this. Things you might look out for are thrombocytopenia, elevated creatinine or BUN. And interestingly, there's actually evidence of renal impairment that precedes hypotension in toxic shock syndrome. So compare that to, say, gram-negative uh, sepsis, where it might be the other way around. LFTs might be up. You might have an elevated, elevated CK. It's still worthwhile doing the blood culture. Um, a lactate, you might see a metabolic acidosis. You're also probably going to consider things like lumbar puncture and serologies for some other mimic conditions that I'm going to talk about next. Um, and then cultures from sort of mucosal and wound sites. And this is important because these isolates can be tested for toxin production, and that could be important for public health purposes later on. Chest X-ray oftentimes will be normal. In the case of strep TSS, you might see an ARDS picture in about 55% of the cases. That's what I saw in the literature. And a CT uh, if you're expecting a, um, a source that's going to guide surgical management, for example. <clears throat> The differential for TS is quite extensive, uh, and many of, the diseases, many of the diseases on this table are going to have overlapping symptoms with TSS. Uh, in the absence of this erythroderma, uh, the TSS is kind of indistinguishable from sepsis or septic shock due to any number of gram-positive or gram-negative um, bacteria. And it's just interesting that, you know, group A strep, you know, there are very few pathogens that can cause as many diverse clinical entities as group A strep. So, you know, if it infects... Uh, the fascia, you might end up with a necrotizing fasciitis. The uh, superficial keratin layer might lead to an impetigo. Subcute tissue for a cellulitis. The muscles for a myositis and my myonecrosis. So, you know, this is a, a dangerous bug. Generally, for these, the characteristics of the rash might clue you in to what's going on. It's not something you're going to hang your hat on. But it might clue you in a little bit. If you see gas in the tissue or pain extending beyond the region of the skin findings, you might start thinking more myonecrosis or necrotizing fasciitis. Um, if you see bullae, maybe impetigo is going to be something that comes to your mind. And cellulitis typically is a less severe disease. For things like meningococcemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, typically these are petechial rashes. In the case of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it usually affects the extremities first, and then the trunks is going to work its way in the opposite way. And you might have some meningeal symptoms for men meningococcemia. SGS10 and staph scalded skin, usually these are going to have a positive Nikolsky sign. So gentle sort of um, touching the outer layer of the skin would lead to exfoliation, kind of due to cleavage of the epidermal dermal junction. Uh, in the case of SGS10, usually there's a drug exposure history as well. Ultimately, though, at this point early on in the emergency department, you're not going to know exactly what's going on. It's probably something infectious, and you're going to kind of treat it as such. So the basic approach to this is going to be like your basic approach to any aggressive sepsis uh, or septic shock. So you're going to start with IV fluids. You're going to have to be pretty aggressive. And in the literature, I see anywhere up to 10 to 20 liters a day are ultimately needed for a lot of these patients. After the first few bags, you might not see very much change in their blood pressure, and then you might have to move over to um, vasopressors. Norepinephrine is what I saw in the literature is most commonly used. Like any sepsis, you're going to start looking for any sources of infection. So it's important not to think, not to forget the common places for this. So um, in staff, you know, nasal packing, hopefully you won't miss the nose, but tampon use as well, that can sometimes be forgotten. If you suspect abscesses, drain what you can. If you think there's a more deep-seated infection, um, Obviously, get your surgical colleagues involved earlier rather than later. And you're going to want to start them on broad-spectrum antibiotics, not just covering, you know, gram-positive. You're going to want to cover pretty much everything, negative, MRSA at this point as well. You're also going to want to give something for toxin suppression, so clindamycin. I'll talk a little bit about that later on in the next slide. And typically, these patients are sick, and they're going to need to go to the ICU. So a word on antibiotics. So I mentioned before, you're going to start broad. Uh, this is just kind of a reasonable regimen that you might want to start with. Obviously, it will depend on your local resistances. Um, later on, you're going to step these patients down. Typically, they require antibiotics for 7 to 14 days. It's not going to influence you in the eMERGE, but it's just good to know. And you'll need to give something to help suppress the toxins. Now, 
Options are going to include clindamycin, that's almost commonly, but gentamicin would also work. Linezolid is another one that I thought I saw that would work. You're not going to give any of these as a monotherapy, obviously, this early on, just based on how they're presenting. Now, Clind is considered the, a bacteriostatic antibody, uh, antibiotic. Um, it is technically bactericidal in certain cases, in certain concentrations, but you're not going to take that risk this early on. And I did see some animal studies and clinical case series that suggested that protein synthesis inhibitors like Clinda and like linezolid um, are better in TSS in general. So that's kind of the basic approach. Um, now, what about the fancy stuff? What's the evidence for or against any of these adjunctive treatments, which have all been described um, with varying levels of um, evidence for TSS? So I'll talk about IVIG use, uh, fluid selection, crystalloids versus colloids, corticosteroids, which we kind of touched on briefly for sepsis, but I'll talk, talk specifically to TSS, and then hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So what of IVIG? Um, so its use still remains controversial. The proposed rationale for using this uh, is that the IVIG and TSS could boost antibody levels by passive immunity in the setting of this overwhelming infection, and it may also help neutralize toxin activity. So there are two important studies that looked specifically at IVIG and TSS that I saw. One of them is this one. This is a Canadian study. It's an observational study of 53 patients. 21 who had strep TSS and received high-dose IVIG, and 32 who did not. Uh, what they found is that the proportion of cases with 30-day uh, with survival was higher, uh, 87% versus 34%. In 2003, a few years later, there was a small RCT uh, that was published. There were a total of 21 patients, 10 of whom received IVIG, 11 of whom received placebo. Uh, the study was underpowered, and it was ended prematurely as a result due to low recruitment. The patients in this were randomly assigned one-to-one, -one, and what they found was that there was a trend towards reduced mortality in the IVIG-treated group compared to the placebo group, 10 versus 36%. Uh, and these results were also supported by improvement um, in organ dysfunction in the IVIG group. That's based on some composite scores that they used. So in summary, there's some evidence supporting the use of IVIG. Currently, no guidelines actively promote its use in this setting. Uh, what they usually recommend is that if you've tried fluids, you've tried vasopressors, this is something you might want to discuss with your ID or intensivist colleagues. Um, dosing is not well established, but typically one to two grams per kilogram up front, and then you're going to step down a little bit, 0.4 grams uh, per kilogram up to five days. Okay, what about albumin infusion? So during TSS and septic shock in general, increased permeability of the small vessels um, to protein leads to an escape of these proteins and decreases in the plasma colloid osmotic pressure. This in turn allows for fluid to shift from the intravascular space, and this is what causes your profound hypotension. This is called a capillary leak phenomenon, to they call it. Uh, the argument here is that if the albumin is low, and perhaps this is a cause, maybe we have to replace that to help expand the volume again. So should we be using albumin infusions to count, combat this leak phenomena? Well, maybe. There are four studies that looked at this in the setting of sepsis. There's nothing specific for TSS. Um, the first one was a meta-analysis, had about 2,000 patients, uh, and they found that using um, albumin-containing fluids was associated with lower mortality compared with other fluid resuscitation agents. In 2003, there was a multicenter RCT which compared colloids and crystalloids in the ICU setting. They found no difference between the two at the 28-day mark, uh, but did find decreased deaths at the 90-day mark with the colloid group. But up to 50% of these patients were treated with other fluids prior to enrollment in the study. Remember, this is in the ICU setting, so it's a bit hard to generalize to where we're working. In 2014, there was another systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, which found that albumin was not effective at reducing um, or causing mortality with sepsis of any severity. That's in people uh, with hypoalbuminemia or without. They did say, however, that it appears to be safe, and they left it at that. And then finally, in 2014, there was an Italian trial. It was a prospective study uh, that looked at patients with severe sepsis or septic shock again and found that albumin replacement in addition to crystalloids didn't improve the rate of survival at the 28 or 90-day mark. Uh, 
Now, taken together, I think the conclusion we can draw from this is that album infusions are probably safe to use as an alternative, but the studies though so far don't really push us in one direction versus another. In any case, there's more recently been a push towards balanced crystalloids with say, the SALT ED trial and the SMART trial this year, because it's arguably it's, it's easier to get your hands on and it's cheaper. Uh, and just to make that point further, um, albumin costs anywhere between 30 to 100 times more than crystalloid solutions, uh, depending on where you work. In the U.S., this is a U.S. report, so it's kind of closer to the 100 mark. So what about the use of corticosteroids? Now, we've sort of talked about this a lot in the context of septic shock, which obviously have some overlapping etiology in, in toxic shock. Um, the guidelines currently wouldn't suggest this. I think that's true of septic shock in general right now, but that could be changing in the future with some recent trials. The only one specifically looking at toxic shock syndrome and corticosteroid use is this one, uh, is a retrospective analysis in 1984, some time back. Um, and what they found then was that there's no difference in clinical course, mortality, uh, length of hospital stay between any of the groups. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So the undersea and hyperbaric medical societies, they include clostridial myonecrosis and necrotizing fasciitis as two of the 13 indications for this treatment. Uh, and in many ways, you know, these are similar to TSS, so there might be some, at least some rationale behind proposing that. Currently, though, there's no RCTs uh, examining the efficacy, efficacy of this treatment, and so it's not routinely indicated. Um, the last slide I want to talk about um, here is uh, is just briefly on what patients would need to know prior to discharge. Um, despite mortality for this condition being quite high, uh, survival rates can exceed 95% if they're treated early enough. So early identification is key. Transmissibility and communicability is important, especially for group A strep infections. Um, for strep infections, mode of transmission is typically by a droplet or direct contact with um, exudates from the wounds or the skin lesions. The period of communicability is, in untreated cases, is anywhere between 10 and 21 days, and transmissibility generally ends within 24 hours of antibiotic, um, of antibiotic therapy. For recurrence, recurrent TSS tends to occur in patients who have not been treated with an appropriate course of antibiotics and who fail to develop an appropriate antibody response to the staph toxins. This is, meant, this is felt to be the etiology behind uh, menstrual TSS in general, because it's felt that those women who do get this the vast majority of people will develop antibodies to, say, staph TSS by the time they're 40 or 50 years old. Patients who have had tampon-associated TSS in the past obviously should not use tampons moving forward, and recurrence can occur anywhere from days to months after the initial episode. Reporting invasive group A strep obviously is considered a reportable disease in BC. Uh, there's more specific information on the BC CDC website, including a fairly long case report form that needs to be filled out. And in close context of patients with known invasive um, group A strep infection do require contact prophylaxis. Again, there's specific guidelines on this on the BCCDC website. Um, you, tip, you ideally want to um, provide this 24 hours, within 24 hours of case identification, but it's good up to seven days after the last contact. And first-generation cephalosporins, from what I could say, were reasonable first-line agents for this. So I know that was fast, but I'm sort of keeping an eye on the clock here as well. Um, thanks for your time, guys. If you have any questions, please let me know.
study of 12 more recently, but it looks at an odd six month outcome of patient reported morbidity. Um, and that shows no difference, but I'm not sure that's as clinically relevant to those two studies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks a lot. That was a great talk. It's a question for you. We see these patients that emerge, they're going to be febrile, sick, have a rash. We know they're septic. We're not really going to make the diagnosis of toxic shock until after the fact. Do you routinely give clindamycin in addition, or do you wait and see? So from what I could see, again, I've not seen many or any cases of this, but what I could see in the literature is that uh, typically was given up front. Now, maybe our ID colleagues will interject here. But what I saw was that clindamycin for that toxin suppression or some agent similar to that was given usually only on in the antibiotic regimen. Whether that's necessary, whether it has to be up front, I don't know, but that's what I was seeing in the studies. Okay. I would say that, yes, I'm recommending clindamycin early or concurrent with the fatal lactam therapies, uh, not only for the toxin mediation, but for the burden of disease. Knowing that in these individuals with this invasive group based strep, there'll be growth types that are in rapid division, but also just in toxin production. And if you have your fatal lactam on board, that's only your, your multiple dividing bacteria. As well, there's some theoretical combined benefit of, you know, in the penicillin resistant, if you are doing monotherapy narrow spectrum that you're getting the clindamycin. And the clindamycin resistance is present in about 20% of our eye gas samples. It's quite a bit of ongoing. Ongoing, yeah. I'm using it up front. The endpoint, unclear. And the evidence for uh, mortality benefit, unclear as well. But it's still a practice pattern that I think has been ingrained given the uh, outcomes, specifically the eye gas and the uh, necrotizing cash layers. Yeah. And linazolid, interestingly, although there's not as much data around it, would be the other agent. If there's some reason I cannot use clindamycin, I'm using linazolid as another agent. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Eddie. That was great. Uh, last one up. Oh, great. We we're going to clap there for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can clap. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Sean Bristol from Plastics. It's just going to kind of round this up uh, to end the day. Yeah. Okay. Hey, thanks. I, I know. I think it's a good chunk of you. Um, I don't have slides prepared because I thought it would be easier if you just kind of thought about the cases that you've seen and stuff that ha you had questions for. And I think the gist of it was how do we decide on surgery versus not? And it's not always that easy. So I, I love the Clinda. We, we, it took me a long time to understand why we were doing Clinda and penicillin or Clinda and X. Um, but uh, we love seeing it now. And there was a lady two days ago that, that had already been started on, on Clinda plus why uh, broad spectrum antibiotics and turned out to have a, what seemed like a shoulder abscess rather than a neck fash. But um, the gist of it for us is we, we, the struggles that we have are, that we see a lot of query neck fascia, here, as, as you know. Um, so we, we see it from the eMERGE, of course, but we see a ton of it from CTU. Um, and I would say that our, our hit rate, for lack of a better word, is much better from the eMERGE than it is from CTU, which you'd expect. Um, and the reason for that is that you guys are seeing the patients when they're acutely ill, and you're calling us when they're acutely ill. And to us, that's one of the major signs is when somebody's acutely ill. So when we get called for a neck fascia consult and we go up and see the patient and they're out for a smoke, they don't have neck bash, um, and that's a pretty easy call. Uh, when, when, and we get called like that a lot from the ward or from 10C, and, and it's a pretty frustrating consult for us because neck fash consult is supposed to be one of the few things in plastic surgery that's life or limb threatening. Um, so if the patient's not sick, pretty good indication they're, they're likely not neck fash. Did you guys already talk about the, the different types the group A strep versus other. So we, we know that at this hospital, there's, there's essentially three types. And at this hospital, we see type one a lot, which is a, which is a polymicrobial as opposed to the invasive group A strep. And the difference there, and we see probably more of that at this hospital than we do the re probably the rest of the country. The polymicrobial is a slower onset and a slower to get worse. So that classic four to six hour invasive group A strep, they've got, you're watching it grow. Uh, that is much less of what we see here. Um, we see this kind of weird polymicrobial thing because a lot of it is the, is the, um, uh, the IBDU population and they're getting into a fascial plane and then they're getting this polymicrobial mixed water with their injectate uh, into that plane. Um, and so they can have that history of three, four, five days rather than six hours ago they started getting really sick and now they're here and you're watching the redness grow up their arm or their leg or whatnot um and so keeping that in mind because we we classically are taught that it's this rapid onset and it needs to get to the operating room right away but a lot of what we're seeing is not that at least at this hospital um 
So what we use, we tend not to use, and, and that kind of lends itself to why I don't even remember it, the lab signs. I don't know if you guys tend to use those as well, the, the sodium and the lactate and the different... I t it's not a lab diagnosis to me. Um, it's generally not a CTMR uh, x-ray diagnosis unless it's clear gas. Now, the other thing that, that's a challenge for us is if there's a wound over top of the area and there's gas... It doesn't help us, right? There's going to be gas underneath the subcutaneous plane if there's a wound over top of that, a post-surgical wound or something like that. So we can't use gas as an indicator in that setting. So then what do we use is, is the patient sick or not? And then I talk to the residents uh, typically about the uh, kind of rings of, of necrotizing fasciitis. So if we think about what necrotizing fasciitis is, it's in the, it's superficial to the deep fascial plane, and it's in a relatively avascular plane. Um, uh, that avascular plane, though, the way the skin survives on that is based on perforating vessels. So for a radial artery, there's going to be little tiny perforators that come out um, and supply the skin in pockets, you know, every several centimeters, several inches or whatnot. And we do little, little different flaps based on those perforators. What the bacteria is doing is it's traveling in that easy plane, that fascial plane, like the scalping plane for, you know, uh, is the equivalent. And it's killing those perforators as it, goes, as it goes past. So as it kills those perforators, you get behind the infection, you're going to get necrosis of the skin. So it's going to look like a bullae, purpuric, or it'll be necrotic, especially in that slower growing one. So if we see that, that's one thing. That's necrosis of the skin behind the infection. Then you see redness. The next ring is redness, inflammation. So that's the response of the overlying skin to this infection, this inflammation. Um, and then depending on the speed of the infection, the next ring is pain. So we're always worried if we see pain outside of the redness, then redness, then necrosis. We see those and they're sick, they've got neck fash uh, as far as we're concerned. And, and so that's almost always what we use rather than specific lab values or anything like that that will direct our care. Um, typically, they're going to have a very high white count, but not always, especially our HIV patients. They may not have the ability to respond. Um, but but you, like when we see white counts in the 20s and 30s, it, it, it's another little tweak towards, okay, yeah, we should probably take this patient because they're quite sick. Uh, but that though, that ring, that diagnostic ring, or the three ring principle, is is what we teach all of the residents, and is very um, it, it, for us, it's very reliable. Because if if there's some an area of necrosis, then redness, and then pain outside of that redness, it means that the bacteria is traveling faster than the skin's response to that bacteria. Okay, so it's traveling beyond the redness, and it's taking some time for that redness to come back and create itself, and that's a worrisome sign. Sorry, there was a question back there. Never a dump. Uh, that's a great question. I never really thought about it that way, actually. Um, it, it's uh, <clears throat> the necrosis is central and then it radiates from there. I wouldn't say it's necessarily proximal or distal, although our concern is more proximal. So I think that we examine it more consistently in a proximal direction because we need to get ahead of it. Um, whereas uh, distal, it's got an endpoint. It's uh, just like Vancouver real estate. There's an endpoint because of the water. Um, so it's it, yeah. I think that we're more concerned about the proximal and the proximal extent because then we're starting to get into you know amputation levels and things like that. Maybe, yeah. 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 But you know, but if you think of of how long overlying skin would survive with no blood supply. It should be in the, in the multi-hour range as opposed to days and days. Um, and it, it's usually the red, the red areas are, quite, are already compromised from a vascularity point of view as well. Um, because the next step that we use is, in, in, and you'll see us do this a lot, and apparently, and I had no idea, but this is actually a fairly unique thing to Vancouver, is we'll do uh, what we call a fascial biopsy. Now, a fascial biopsy is a misnomer because I do not care at all what the biopsy says. Um, that's, that, that management is too, or it's later. Um, if it comes back and it says group A strep, but the patient's not acting like a group A strep, it doesn't matter. So what I do is I make a cut, not over the necrotic area, but usually just adjacent to it, somewhere that theoretically I can get some freezing into and it might work. 
what I've just started to experiment with is um, in the setting of infection, I, I, when I'm doing procedures, I usually do multiples of them, and so I will buffer with bicarb in a 9 to 1 ratio, but I'm starting to experiment with a slightly higher ratio in infections to see if that the acidity of the infection, I can kind of overcome that a little bit with the bicarb. I don't know if that works. I need a chemist to figure it out and what the combination are. So don't start doing it, but that's what I'm trying is just adding a bit more bicarb to see if I can get some... Uh, anesthesia over the area and then I make a cut down to the deep fascia and the key there is to the deep fascia and I've been tricked six months ago I was tricked I thought I was at the deep fascia and turned out I was superficial like in the scarp is equivalent fascia rather than the deep fascia and then it's a finger sweep um, and so if I get my finger down to the to to the deep fascia and I can do a full sweep that patient goes to the OR um, because what it means is that infection has killed all of those fascial attachments and perforators and all the things that are attaching the skin to the underlying tissue. And if the infection's done that, then we've got to get ahead of it. Uh, so that, that's the, the finger sweep is the important part of the fascial biopsy to us. Now, we will always try to take a piece of fascia and send it to the lab to confirm the, the uh, microbiology so that we can get appropriate microbiologic management afterwards. Um, but even if it comes back as group A strep and my finger sweep is negative, either I didn't do a good finger sweep or I'm, I'm confident and I'm still going to watch the patient with antibiotics, for instance. Does that make sense? Sorry, please. What's, I mean, how do you define the infection? Let's say you got some... You're, you're, you're almost at the muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. So we, we have, and we only really talk about scarpus fascia as the superficial fascia in, in the abdomen, but we have the scarpus equivalent fascia everywhere in the body. And in plastics, we know it because it's the one that my co cosmetic colleagues use to do facelifts. Um, and but all or thigh lifts or arm lifts, there's a superficial fascia layer. The deep fascia is the fascia over top of the muscle, and that's meant to be the plane that the, the bacteria travel in, uh, as opposed to that, that cellulitic superficial fascia. Please. Are, are there any ultrasound findings? I mean, maybe this is a question for Aron. Um, uh, things that we can do to help you or things that you would expect us to look for in doing ultrasound? I, I t again, can't, it's really, a, for the most part, a clinical exam for me unless somebody sees gas uh, it, it, without a wound overlying it. Um, if you see gas, uh, you're done. The fascial fluid and everything is really yeah. nervous and you never really know. And you can have it with cellulitis. You can't really prove it. But if you see gas, you should never see gas. Unless there's a wound. Unless there's a yeah. wound, right? Yeah, we've you're been... Just looking over red skin. So the, just along those lines, sorry, the, the, the finger sweep is what I'll, what we'll use in the OR as well. Uh, so I don't stop until the finger sweep stops, uh, even if the skin overlying looks okay. Um, We'll, we'll generally not cut that skin out. I usually try to only cut out the necrotic dead skin and anything that's, that's uh, so for instance, just doing, you know, great big slash up the leg to, to get to the proximal extent. But the deep part, I don't stop until my finger sweep stops. And we may not cut away all that skin because the overlying skin is actually viable and then it means less grafting and reconstruction down the road. As long as we're getting, um, hopefully, exposure to oxygen and a big, big washout. Um, and then we typically do... Um, uh, very careful dressing care afterwards. So it's two to three times a day they're getting saline soaks so that they're getting some mechanical debridement as well of whatever's there. And it's just getting repeated looks consistently. And if they're not getting better, like we know they're going to get worse in the first 24 hours. They typically get a, a bacterial shower and they get, a, if they haven't already had a SERS response, they're going to get one from the surgery. Um, but if they're not getting better after 24 hours, we'll take them back to the operating room and see what we missed. Um, usually it's, it spreads directly, but we've seen weird and wonderful cases of bilaterals and things like that. It tends to be unlikely, but, but bacteremic spread, who knows where it really goes. Sorry. Are those patients getting hyperbaric? Uh, they, they have to be well enough, um, to, to get there. Uh, and so that's the, that's the challenge. And then, cause when they dive them, they don't have the opportunity to get in there quickly if they're coding or suffering or anything like that. So I haven't found hyperbaric to be a, a super valuable part of the acute management because uh, it's really surgical management at that stage. I don't know. Have you had any experience with it? Yeah. No, it's always theoretical, but I think the role for hyperbaric is 
done with your surgeries and you're trying to salvage that edge, yeah. we do this for diabetic foot infections or chronic right. osteomyelitis, but logistically, uh, it's a challenge, yeah. Right? yeah. So you <clears throat> need to repeat the long ones. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not even sure, is there a bed here? No, it's, uh, we send it over to VGH. They're great. The group of VGH is great at, at, at taking the consult and, and talking about it. I just, I would, when you don't have access to the patient and they're acutely ill, then then it would be a, a, a challenge. So the research says that it just delays surgery. Surgery is really the treatment. So it's not recommended at this point. In order, like after the surgery is done or after the repeat surgeries are done and you're trying to salvage a limb potentially, then at that point, uh, hyperbaric oxygen seems like it might have some benefit. Same thing with IVIG and kind of IVF. So right away, the focus is, is like make the diagnosis, get surgery involved, and then kind of figure out the rest, right? And the, the key point that they always talk about is this pain out of proportion, especially pain or paresthesias outside the erythematous margin. Like that should really clue you in that this is potentially a neck bash versus some sort of cellulitis mm -hmm. or other sort of neck disease. That's and we. Point. We, it, it becomes incredibly hard at this hospital because of the, the, the patients that have uh, addiction issues. They have massive pain out of proportion most of the time because they've either been hours from their last hit or what. So that is a, is a very difficult diagnosis at times with our, with our challenging patients here. Um, so it, it, one of the things that I would impart to you when you're calling us, if you're, if you're not getting through to the resident you're concerned, call the staff directly. Uh, if, if you call us and you say, I don't have all the criteria, but I'm really worried about this patient, we're going to come. Okay. Um, if they're out having a smoke, we'll be less enthusiastic. <laughs> In the absence of a handy surgeon. Yes. I, I think the fascial biopsy slows things down. I think it does. Uh, cause it, if it's, if it's, um, anaerobic, it, you're, Getting air to it uh, is one thing, um, and and I, I don't think there's a kind of an inflammatory principle of making a cut that helps you necessarily, but but you may get above it to some degree. Um, but yeah, uh, you, the surgeons are were I would hope to think that this group would say that we're readily available because uh, we we know we know when you guys are worried the patient's sick. Awesome. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Well, thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you. Okay. See ya.